where did we leave off last time? So remember we defined these Ginsburg-Landau functionals. Mm -hmm. So for a general target, we had these, you know, that was embedded in some RL. Here we're thinking about the n-sphere and rn plus 1 specifically. OK, and um, based on sort of the Liao conformal volume, we had this min-max energy we introduced, en epsilon on the surface with some reference metric. And we showed, right, these are, well, we didn't show, I asserted, right, these cor there exist critical points u epsilon with this energy coming from sort of standard min-max methods and such that um, their Morse index is bounded above by n plus 1. Uh, and moreover, we had that if we defined E scripts of n to be the limit as epsilon goes to 0 of these min-max energies, then in fact that was a conformal invariant which we said was going to be bigger than or equal to half of the maximum of this area normalized first eigenvalue in the conformal class. So last time, where we left off, was trying to show that, um, in fact, as epsilon goes to 0 and n gets large, we don't have um, energy concentration. So in particular, we argued last time, I sort of sketched the idea, essentially it boiled down to making the right computation, that because of this index bound, this n plus 1 index bound, we could show that there's a universal constant C, such that just relying on the Morse index bound of n plus 1, we have that um, lambda 1 of the Laplacian for the conformal metric gn sub epsilon is bigger than or equal to 1 minus a constant over n. So in particular, for n large, we're getting closer and closer to 1. Right, and so I sketched out sort of the, the test vector fields you plug into the, the index bound to, to get that information. All right, so now coming to the question that uh, Mathilde asked at the very end, right, so this gn epsilon here is going to be 1 minus, so if this critical point is un sub epsilon, the conformal factor here is this, okay, over... What's my convention? Just an epsilon squared or a two epsilon squared? I think that should be an epsilon squared. OK, so the area is going to be just the integral of this 1 minus un epsilon squared over epsilon squared. OK, and I claim that it's an easy consequence of the, the PDE satisfied by these critical points. And this is, in fact, always an upper bound for the integral of, um, well, just the, the energy times 2, right? So du squared plus 1 minus u squared squared over 2 epsilon squared, which is twice en epsilon, OK? So in particular, we already have this, this lower bound of this min-max energy by this conformal max. But now we see that if we take lambda 1 bar for this conformal metric g n epsilon, right? so we're taking lambda 1 Laplacian g n epsilon <laughs> times the area. Well, this lambda 1, we said, is bounded below by 1 minus c over n. And then we just have twice en epsilon here. 
So in particular, taking the soup over epsilon, we get lambda 1 bar of g n epsilon is bigger than or equal to 1 minus c over n twice e sub n. Right, on the other hand, we also know that this is bounded below, right, this is bounded above by definition by this lambda 1 of mg, because that's just the soup over all these lambda 1 bars in the conformal class. And then this is right is bounded below by uh, 1 minus c over n lambda 1. OK, so already, sorry? You, so here, this un sub epsilon is, is going to be the min-max critical point realizing this energy. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, so that should be a un epsilon, too. I was getting lazy with subscripts. Thank you. Yeah, OK. Yeah, please continue to uh, interrupt with questions and comments. OK, so in particular, as n goes to infinity, this immediately gives us that these uh, min-max energies En converge to uh, this conformal max. All right, and in fact, we can show that equality holds before passing to the limit. So let me just sort of sketch out those ideas quickly. All right, so at this point, once we have this lower bound on the first eigenvalue, there's sort of a, a standard collection of tricks that people in uh, the spectral geometry world know well. So given that lambda 1 of mg and epsilon, even without this sharp bound, just knowing, for instance, that it's bounded below by a half, it tells us that if we pick our favorite geodesic disk of some small radius inside of m, then we know that um, lambda 1 is going to be bounded from above by the first Dirichlet eigenvalue for this metric on, on the, the ball or in its complement, right, by the uh, variational characterization. Right, so this is bounded above by the first Dirichlet eigenvalue on the ball for gn epsilon or the first Dirichlet eigenvalue on the complement. Right, so what does that mean? That means either we have that um, the integral phi squared, you know, 1 minus un epsilon squared over epsilon squared we have this is bounded above by, well, if this is bounded below by, again, let's just use the cheap sort of one half for now. And this is bounded above by, let's say, uh, 2 times the integral d phi squared, either for all phi compactly supported in that disk, right, or for all phi compactly supported in the complement, right? OK, so in particular, if this holds for all phi compactly supported in the disk, well, then we can use uh, you know, just log cutoff functions to see that as r gets very, very small, right? So use log cutoffs to see that um, integral on, let's say, b I know r squared of 1 minus un epsilon squared over epsilon squared is going to be bounded above like c over log r. OK. So in particular, as r is getting small, this would tell us we can't have um, energy concentration at small scales, right? So this is going to be less than sort of the threshold in our Ginsburg-Landau epsilon regularity for are sufficiently small. OK, and I asserted over here 
without getting into details, right, that we have this global control of, you know, sort of our Ginsburg-Landau energy by just this 1 minus u squared over epsilon squared that's really not too hard to read off from the PDE. And similarly, this is sort of, you can tell it, we have this control at the, the local level as well. So if we have this less than eta naught, then in this region we'll have smooth convergence to uh, harmonic maps. So the only other option then is this other one, where now we'll get, we can use log cutoff functions on the complement, and we can see that the integral of, let's say, m minus b square root of r, we don't have energy concentrating or any energy living anywhere outside of a small ball. OK, but what does that mean? That means that all of the energy, so in case two, which is the case we want to rule out, that means essentially we can pretend that gn epsilon is concentrated in some small ball. OK, or in you know, the notation up there, b square root of r, but the point is some, some small geodesic disk, right? Which we can identify conformally as some subset of the two sphere, right? And somehow using log cutoffs in a variant of Hirsch's, um, Hirsch's trick, we can check, and this is, I mean, I think you know, this shows up throughout the eigenvalue literature in Kokarov's work and Petridis's work, et cetera, that um, the lambda 1 Dirichlet in this, uh, this geodesic disk times the area, so we, this is all for g n epsilon, So again, keeping in mind this is all concentrated inside this disk, this has to be bounded above like, uh, like 8 pi. This is, this is the case where, oh, thank you, yes, this should be inside now, yeah. That's right. So we're saying, we're assuming that the, the metric's concentrating inside the disk in this case 2 here, right? Right. Okay. But now we're saying that we're in the case where this is going to be exactly the lambda 1 bar globally, because our metric is concentrating in the disk. So lambda 1 bar of m gn epsilon must be, and really there's some limits here as epsilon's going to 0 and so on. But roughly speaking, this is bounded above like 8 pi. OK, but then we just said that this lambda 1 bar gn epsilon is bounded below like 1 minus c over n twice this min-max energy, which is bounded below by 1 minus c over n times that conformal max. OK? And now we can appeal to uh, a very important result of Roman. I mean, somehow there are by now, a few different approaches to the existence of conformally maximal metrics, but all of them rely crucially on this estimate. So Roman's work gives us that for any non-sphere, when m is anything other than s2, we have strict inequality here. That conformal max is strictly uh, above the conformal max on the sphere. This is somehow the analog in the setting of like the Shane Oban estimate in the in the Amabe setting, right? So in particular, this tells us that we have some fixed gap here. And so for n sufficiently large, this can't occur, right? So that tells us we must be in case 1, which means energy isn't concentrating, which means un epsilon has you know, uniform C1 estimates, OK, in fact, you know, W2P or whatever you want, 
So in particular, uh, as epsilon goes to 0, this tells us that un epsilon converges in a nice sense to a harmonic map u from m to the n sphere, let's say u sub n, which is going to continue to have index bounded above by n plus 1, energy realizing this min-max energy. And, um, and uniform gradient estimates. So let's say dun L infinity bounded above by some c. All right, as soon as n is sufficiently large. OK. So Sorry, what? Where is it possible to get a lambda one is less than the minimum of the two? Lambda one is less than the minimum. Um, uh, let's see. So no, I mean, I, I, let's see. Yeah, yeah, in principle, I think it could be. Yeah. Why do you ask? If it's less than the minimum, then it seems to me that the two are the coupling or no? Hmm? Well, no, I, I just need that it's less than or equal to the, the max here, right? The point is that, you know, I mean, lambda 1, is, it's defined as some infimum, right? And the point is that the, the max of these two, you know, gives us a collection of families which are, you know, somewhere within that is a test function for that infimum, right? Okay. All right. So, um, right. So we have this these uniform estimates now, and that essentially gets us to the punchline. So, in particular, what does that tell us? That gives us um, information about the Schrodinger operators. that look like Laplacian minus dung squared. So the things that the coordinate functions have to satisfy, uh, you know, have to lie in the kernel of to be harmonic maps to Sn. If this is uniformly bounded in L infinity, or in fact any LP for P bigger than 1, then we can say that the dimension of the kernel has some uniform upper bound as n goes to infinity. OK. But that means exactly that our space of coordinate functions has to have some uniform dimension upper bound, which means that, in fact, we're taking values in some sphere of fixed size, even though a priori we're taking values in higher and higher dimensional spheres, right? So this capital N is fixed as little n gets large. OK? So finally, that's going to tell us that, all right, we can check, it's just sort of a straightforward computation, that the energy index, you know, the Morse index, the energy functional for these maps un, is going to be bounded below by the index of this Schrodinger operator, right, as an operator on scalars, times the difference between n minus n, because you get for each uh, sort of direction here perpendicular to that, uh, that equatorial s of n inside, you can multiply it by test functions or eigenfunctions for this and get, uh, get variation fields here. Right? So you get this bounded below by this index times n minus n. But then this tells you, remember, this is fixed, and this is bounded above like n plus 1. So to leading order, as little n gets large, we just have you know, n here and n here times some integer, which tells you that integer has to be one. So the Schrodinger operator has to have index one for 
n sufficiently large. OK, but that then tells us that the metrics g sub n have eigenvalue for the Laplacian suitably interpreted. Right, This isn't going to be an honest metric where this is 0, but it's still going to be fine for the purposes of defining eigenvalues. There could be some conical singularities. But this is going to be bounded below. This is going to be exactly uh, 2. All right, and so putting everything together, this tells us that um, lambda 1 bar of gn is going to be exactly uh, the same as the min-max energy and this capital lambda 1. I guess I should have a uh, 2 here, right? And so we see that uh, that equality holds for n sufficiently large. OK, I'm clearly leaving out lots of details here, but I claim that these are sort of, at this point, it just reduces to computations. OK? All right, so let me make a, a quick remark that's going to play a role in um, uh, Misha's talk later today, which is that you can generalize Uh, to cover the case, let's say lambda 1, and I'll put a little superscript gamma there, where if suppose gamma is some discrete subgroup of diffeomorphisms, and G is invariant under the action, then if we consider the supremum among those gamma invariant metrics in that conformal class, it's going to be associated to a similar min-max energy. Where maybe I won't uh, give any details, but it's sort of very similar to this construction if you sort of replace r to the m in the case where you know, gamma is trivial here with the group algebra of gamma to the m. Okay? And then somehow you do an analogous construction, and you get uh, in the limit this nice thing. And remember, we have this key property here. So what's sort of the key corollary, the key black box to come out of this? So now this tells us that we have this nice sort of generalization of the Hirsch trick to every conformal class that um, so for every functional in W12 dual, we can find a map to some sphere such that the energy is bounded above by half that conformal max, and um, such that each one of the n plus 1 coordinate functions here is in the kernel of, of t, right? They're all on the, the hyperplane, perpendicular to that. So that turns out to be useful for a lot of things. For instance, we're sort of showing regularity and rigidity for arbitrary maximizing measures for these eigenvalues. You can somehow take the conformal, the conformal uh, factor there to be a very sort of weak measure and still get regularity if it's a maximizer. You can promote this to some stability results. But the application I want to talk about for the next, say, 20 minutes or so is this application to this problem I mentioned yesterday of the key sort of inequality that remains to prove global existence. So remember, if we want to show that there exists a maximizing metric on the oriented surface of genus gamma plus 1, not conformally, we have the existence conformally, but among all conformal classes, 
then Roman has this argument that tells us that we want to prevent degeneration of a maximizing sequence of conformal classes to the boundary of Teichmuller space, then it's sufficient to prove this strict inequality, that if we take the soup of this lambda 1 bar over all metrics in the surface of higher genus, it's strictly bigger than the, uh, the soup on the surfaces of, of lower genus. So let me outline a strategy here. So let's assume this inequality fails somewhere. Right, so assume we're at the first genus where this fails. So we have lambda 1 of gamma plus 1 is equal to um, lambda 1. I should mention the non-strict inequality is not too bad to show. But that's strictly bigger than lambda 1, bless you, of gamma minus 1. So we really want to consider the first genus where this fails. And then consider, sorry? That's right. So the, the non-strict inequality is not hard to show. OK. All right. So we're going to fix, uh, let's say, g naught then on the surface of genus gamma, realizing this, right? So maximizing lambda 1 bar. OK, so this equality tells you that for every metric on the surface of higher genus, lambda 1 bar of g is bounded above by, well, this lambda 1 bar of g naught, right? And previous attempts to prove strict inequality have sort of worked at this level, where you try to construct by hand a metric g which violates this inequality. But you also get information just at the conformal level. So another sort of, if you like, uh, equivalent conclusion, but just phrased differently, is that for every conformal class on the surface of genus gamma plus 1, we have that this lambda 1, this capital lambda 1, this conformal max, is bounded above by lambda 1 bar of g naught. All right, so the idea now, instead of trying to construct a metric by hand, is to just use this conformal information and squeeze something out of this sort of uh, improved Hirsch trick here. So we're going to get some special comparison map on a surface by attaching a handle. OK. So now, as sort of all attempts to, to prove this go, we're going to start by attaching a handle to our maximizing metric on the lower genus surface. But now we only care about the conformal structure of the thing we get by attaching the handle. We're no longer going to worry too much about the precise geometry. OK. So on n gamma g naught, let's pick any two points Let's see. So we're going to pick some pair of points. And the fact that we can choose them arbitrarily is important. OK. And then let's pick some small epsilon, you know, much smaller than the distance between them. And we're going to attach a handle in the, the simplest way we can think of. So let's uh, cut out the disks of radius epsilon around p and q, and then attach. So this isn't going to be a, a smooth metric we're building, but it'll be a fine enough metric for doing these optimization problems. right? And let's just glue on, say, a circle of radius epsilon cross the interval of length epsilon times l. OK? So we're getting something which, you know, it's not an honest smooth metric, but it's sort of, you know, it's going to be, if you like, conformally equivalent to a smooth metric with a degenerate conformal factor. And if it makes you squeamish, you can always mollify this by some teeny tiny amount. OK, so now we're getting some new conformal class on a surface of genus 1 higher. OK, so let's call this, call the resulting object m gamma plus 1 g prime. So now, what's the idea? Well, we want to somehow 
let, let, let's pretend that we're just running the conformal maximization here. We're going to get um, some harmonic map here, which we expect that as we make this cylinder smaller and smaller, we'll look in the limit like a harmonic map by first eigenfunctions on the lower genus guy. But at the same time, the energy of that harmonic map on the higher genus guy with the handle attached is going to satisfy this upper bound, right? It's going to be bounded above by the energy of that, that map downstairs. So the idea, which is sort of very naive starting point, but it turns out to work roughly, is that we shouldn't be allowed to have too much energy stored in that handle. And if we can't have that much energy stored in that handle, maybe the value of the limiting map at those points can't be too far apart. Okay. So we'll end up with this eigenmap, which identifies that pair of points. And we're choosing those points arbitrarily. So we'll end up with a strong condition. Okay. So maybe let me illustrate a few details of how to actually make this idea rigorous. Okay. So let's use our Hirsch trick. So using this uh, uh, top of the second board over there, um, we can find some f on this handle surface, this gamma plus 1 guy, to Sn, such that, well, it's going to have energy bounded above by twice, or excuse me, by half lambda 1 bar of the maximizing metric on the surface of genus gamma. And we can arrange now that the coordinates of that f are in the kernel of whatever operator we want. So let's go ahead and ask that the integral of f hat over the surface downstairs is 0, where f hat is just f on m minus the disks and f hat inside of those disks is just the harmonic extension. Right, so it'll stop being sphere valued in there, but the point is these disks are very small. Right? OK. And then we ask that this, uh, this average is 0, right? So all of our, our test functions, all of our component functions are going to be test functions for the Rayleigh quotient on the genus gamma guy downstairs. OK. So, so this is a G prime, and this is a you know, sub epsilon sub L. So if you like, it's, it's this singular metric that we've created here, or really just the conformal class of that thing. OK? So we really only care about the conformal structure for this, this argument. All right. So let me just point at a few estimates to give you the gist of how this works. OK. So first of all, because f hat is a harmonic extension of this map on these two circles into those disks. And we know what the values are on this flat cylinder we've attached. You can actually estimate just very directly you know, the, uh, you know, how energy changes when you take the harmonic extension from a cylinder to the boundary circle into a disk. And so by direct computation, you can check the following easily. So if you look at the energy of this df hat squared on the union of the disks that were cut out, then it's going to be bounded above by 1 plus a constant times e to the minus l of the integral of df squared over the cylinder. OK? And I think that's really just a computation you can do for you know, taking a cylinder, it's a map on a cylinder, looking at the boundary data, and doing the harmonic extension. You can write things out pretty explicitly. 
OK. So now what does that net us? Well, that tells us that if we look at the energy of this df hat map downstairs on m gamma with our fixed maximizing metric, then this is going to be bounded above by, well, f, remember, f hat agrees outside of the disks with the original one. And then in the, inside those disks, it's going to be almost the contribution on the remainder of uh, the gamma plus 1 metric with this extra e to the minus l part attached. So what we see is it's bounded above by the energy on this gamma plus 1 plus, uh, let's see, is something unclear? OK. OK. Don't be shy about asking questions. Right, but the point is that this is going to be bounded above by um, this energy plus we get this extra c e to the minus l integral of this cylindrical energy. Right, which again, our, our goal in the end, or part of our goal is to show that cylindrical energy is, is small. Right? OK. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we're saying assume the, the desired strict inequality fails. And I'm going to show you that for every pair of points, we're going to get some eigenmap, so some sphere valued map by first eigenfunctions, things which should be pretty rare, which is going to identify that pair of points. We don't need. No, we're, we're trying to show strict inequality. So the starting point is assuming that it fails. OK? OK. All right, so we have this information. So in particular, this is bounded above by lambda 1 bar, right by our, our key assumption here, the assumption that the, in, the equality holds. And plus, you know, we can just be a little cheap here and say c e to the minus l, because we know this is going to have some universal bound. OK, so what's the idea now is to apply, and this showed up a lot in sort of work on the stability for the eigenvalue maximization problem is to apply Cauchy-Schwartz to the quadratic form on Rn plus 1 valued maps given by q of phi phi is integral over m gamma d phi squared minus lambda 1. This is still just of our downstairs maximizing metric on the lower genus guy, and then integral of phi minus its average squared, right? So by definition of the, the first eigenvalue, this is a non-negative definite quadratic form. So we can apply Cauchy-Schwartz, and we see that, um, in particular, from this computation, we can check that q of f hat, f hat, is going to be, well, um, bounded above by this remainder term here, right? So we get a c e to the minus l df l2 on the cylinder squared. And then if f hat were honestly sphere valued, we could just stop here. f hat you know, stops being sphere valued on these little disks of radius epsilon, but that's only going to make uh, an epsilon of difference here, an epsilon squared, maybe. OK? Lambda one, lambda one this, this lambda 1 is the real lambda 1. Because okay. this is here we're just using, for the non-negativity of this form, we're just using the definition of, of lambda 1 very efficiently. OK? All right. So in particular, we can use Cauchy-Schwartz to tell us that for any map phi, we get that um, integral over m gamma df hat d phi minus lambda 1 integral of m f hat phi is going to be bounded above like this error to the square root. So we can say e to the minus l over 2 dfl2 in the cylinder 
plus epsilon times square root of q phi phi. Okay? So, maybe since I want to get to the supercritical story, I'll be a little brief here. But the punchline is that we have enough information so far to know that the energy of this df hat squared, um, the portion on, so the energy of df squared on just the original surface minus those disks is going to be bigger than or equal to lambda 1 bar. This comes from a computation with log cutoff functions up to some c over log epsilon. And since we know that the total energy when we add in the cylindrical component is bounded above by this lambda 1 bar, it tells us that the cylinder part is at worst constant over log epsilon. All right, so this gives us Okay. So in particular, all these places up here where we have this cylindrical energy, we can throw in a, a log epsilon instead, a 1 over log epsilon. All right. So just from this, this is the estimate, the, an energy estimate for a map on a cylinder. So by the fundamental theorem of calculus, essentially, and some Cauchy-Schwartz, you can check that the average of f on one boundary of the cylinder minus the average on the other boundary is bounded above like C root L over root log epsilon. Okay? That's really just a, a, a calc one computation. Okay. So now let's decompose this map f hat, which maybe we'll call f hat sub epsilon l, to remind you we have some parameters floating around. We can decompose it into, let's say, phi epsilon sub l plus r epsilon sub l, where this is a map by first eigenfunctions. Not sphere value to this point. We're really just taking the projection onto the first eigenspace here. And this is a map by higher eigenfunctions, or by, you know, the, the sum of higher eigenfunctions, right? So in particular, using our little Cauchy-Schwartz thing there, we can check that this remainder term has to be small in W12, right? And this is, again, just a really direct computation using the estimates we've gathered here so far. And this is going to be bounded above by C e to the minus l over log epsilon. OK, so this map f hat here is w12 close with you know, sort of precise bounds to a map by first eigenfunctions. OK? And moreover, we can use this to see that the integral, the average of this r epsilon over this disk of radius epsilon is bounded above like c e to the minus, let's put a, uh, yeah, e to the minus L over 2. And we have to stop there. So because, of course, you know, if we could control it directly by the W12 norm, well, as epsilon goes to 0, that would tell us that W12 embeds into C0, right? That's obviously not true. But what we lose is exactly this log epsilon here, which we fortunately already had floating around. So the average of this remainder term is just this C e to the minus l over 2, all right, which tells us, combining these two, that the average of this map by first eigenfunctions over the first disk minus 
the average over the second boundary component is bounded above by, well, the sum of these two, right? So by something like root L over root log epsilon plus e to the minus L over 2. And remember this phi epsilon, this is a map by first eigenfunctions, which is you know, a finite dimensional space of smooth functions on this m gamma down here. So if this average is close for epsilon um, uh, very, very small, well, this, has, this is sort of you know, uniformly smooth independent of epsilon and L. So this tells us that, in fact, phi epsilon L takes values close to each other on, at the points P and Q. Right? We have uniform CK estimates in this first eigenspace. So long story short, or maybe still kind of long, taking uh, epsilon going to 0 and fixing L for now, we see that in the limit, we get a map by first eigenfunction. Since these are converging in L2, and this is mostly sphere-valued, in fact, yeah, we'll see that uh, this phi has to be sphere-valued. So for that means for each L, and remember for an arbitrary pair of points P and Q2, we get this phi from m gamma, some Sn by first eigenfunctions. So it's one of these sphere-valued eigenmaps such that, I'll call it phi sub L, phi sub L of P minus phi sub L of Q is bounded above like e to the minus L over 2. OK? All right, and now we're still in this you know, finite dimensional space of maps by first eigenfunctions. We can pass L to the limit as L goes to infinity, and we get the following. So proposition, if we're in the situation where the bad thing happens, we have equality here. Then for every pair of points, there exists a sphere-valued eigenmap, mapped by first eigenfunction specifically, f, which if you'd like, maybe you should have some p comma q subscript here, which identifies them. That's right, so we take the limit as L goes to infinity. What does, this, what does it do to conform a class to let L go to infinity? So if we're really thinking about the metrics here, then I mean it's, it's stretching out this, this handle, right? But the point is, we've already gotten our maps, yeah. right? So we're not actually worried about what happens to the metrics at this point. We just use this information to extract these maps. And you're right, so the information is somehow coming from, you know, as we've shrunk epsilon goes to zero, and then sort of take these, these cylinders to be increasingly long. OK? All right. So we end up with this relation. And we conjecture that this should never hold. So for instance, it seems like sort of the worst situation that one actually encounters that you can imagine is if you're on, say, um, you know, if you're thinking about the case where gamma is 1, then on the equilateral torus, somehow along your lattice directions, you can identify points by circle-valued eigenmaps. But then that's only in you know, three different directions. You can't do that across all possible directions. So conjecture, this never happens. OK, and a little evidence to support that is a variant of this argument. So I'll put some evidence. A variant with two handles instead of one gives that if lambda 1 of gamma plus 2 is equal to lambda 1 of gamma, well, then you can do this, but now with a pair of pairs of points. So for every p1, p2, q1, q2, we attach a handle across these two and attach another handle across these two. 
we have a map, a sphere valued eigen map. which identifies both of these pairs, right? So f of pi is equal to f of qi for i equals 1 and 2. And if you have that, then you can sort of imagine, take sort of p1 and p2 close to each other here, take q1 here and q2 here. Then if you pass to a limit where you sort of shrink these together and shrink these together at the same time, you get for each point, uh, you know, a map is above such that df actually vanishes altogether at that point. But for sphere valued eigenmaps in the maximizing metric, at least away from conical singularities, you have that df squared is always equal to 2. Okay? Or equal to, I guess, a constant depending on your scaling, right? So in particular, this fails. And so it tells us that we always have the strict inequality lambda 1 of gamma plus 2 is strictly bigger than lambda 1 of gamma. So at least when you jump up by 2, you do have strict inequality. And, um, and so in particular, you have, at the very least, existence for sort of every other genus. OK, we'll also see that in certain equivariant settings that are useful for producing minimal surfaces in low dimensions, um, you can sort of prove the analogous thing by hand. In that case, sort of your first eigenspace is lower dimensional. And so you can really sort of rule these things out uh, pretty directly. And for one little bit of sort of fun evidence for this is that by a variant of this argument where you only have, um, you know, so just with the genus jumping up by one, if you have such a pair of maps, by taking sort of a similar limit um, for just a pair of points, you can see that for any uh, prescribed vector in the tangent bundle, you know, at any given point, you can find one of these eigenmaps where df has to vanish at that vector. And using the Bachner identity, that would actually force your maximizing metric to be non-positively curved. So it's a, um, and we know, for instance, the flat case wouldn't work. And I'll mention it's a question in Yao's sort of problem section on minimal surfaces, which is, to my knowledge, still unsolved, whether there exist any negatively curved minimal surfaces in the sphere. So if you could find a counterexample, it's likely you would get uh, a negatively curved minimal surface in the sphere, which would be kind of fun. All right, so I think I've done enough in dimension two so that uh, Misha can sweep some things under the rug in his talk. So let me uh, say a few words in the remaining 35 minutes about the supercritical case. So now I'm talking about existence for the harmonic map problem in supercritical dimension. So on domains of dimension bigger than or equal to 3, where the problem becomes much more singular in general. So at the early in the previous lecture, I mentioned you know, we have this classic lusternic fet theorem which tells us that S1 is a universal source, a universal donor for the harmonic map problem, right? So any n, you know, closed Riemannian manifold admits a non-constant closed geodesic. So if you like a harmonic map from S1 into n. And I claimed that even in the supercritical setting, we can say something about universal recipients. So we always get existence of fairly nice, more or less optimally regular harmonic maps to, for instance, spheres of dimension 3 and higher, to uh, compact simple Lie groups, um, to let's say, uh, three manifolds with positive Ricci and higher dimensional manifolds with something like positive isotropic curvature. Where what all of these have in common is that they don't have any stable minimal two spheres inside. So let me give you a, 
and I guess they have some uh, non-trivial higher homotopy group. Those are the two features. They're non-aspherical. Okay, so result with Misha from last year is that for n closed and non-aspherical, so that means for some k bigger than 1, pi k of n is non-zero, and such that n contains no you know, non-constant stable minimal two spheres, then there exists a non-constant stationary harmonic map u from m to n with index bounded above by k plus 1, where k is the, the index of that homotopy group there, um, and partial regularity. So we can say, in particular, the dimension of the singular set is bounded above like n minus m, where m is what you would expect, right? It's the first dimension with stable, homogeneous, non-constant maps from Rm. So you know the tangent maps, stable tangent maps from Rm to n. And this is for any Mn closed with n bigger than or equal to 3. So any domain. Any closed domain in supercritical dimension has a, uh, a non-constant harmonic map of what I would describe as more or less optimal regularity. So in particular, this m is um, never less than 3. So these always have singular set at worst of co-dimension 3 as for, for minimizing maps from Shane Ullenbeck stuff. But in fact, you can do better in certain targets. So for instance, building on sort of the improved regularity results of Shane and Uhlenbeck uh, for minimizing sphere-valued maps and then upgraded by Lin and Wang for stable sphere-valued maps, we can get the following corollary, which is that for every closed domain in supercritical dimension, There exists, uh, once again, stationary finite index harmonic map from m to the sphere, such that now the dimension of the singular set is bounded above like n minus k minus 1. That's sharp if k is 3, 4, or 5. n minus 6, this is not necessarily sharp. If k is between 6 and 9. And then, in general, n minus 7, which is in some sense sharp, if k is at least 10. So in particular, as k, if we get maps, non-trivial harmonic maps, to spheres of every dimension at least 3, as soon as k is large enough, those singular sets always have, at worst, co-dimension 7. Um, if our manifold has dimension 3, 4, or 5, then we're a smooth harmonic map as soon as the dimension of the sphere matches the, the uh, domain that we're working on. Ah, so there's, there's an obvious constraint here. This condition that there's no stable minimal two spheres tells us that k must be at least 3 here. That's right. And in particular, 
somehow, I'll mention that if we didn't put, without the stable condition here, if you say for a closed non-aspherical target with no minimal two spheres, then the analysis necessary to prove this was known before, but sachs ullenbeck tells us that every non-aspherical manifold has minimal two spheres. So in that case, it would be a vacuous statement. Whereas with the stable condition, you get lots of targets for which this works. And the punchline really is that this condition of no stable minimal two spheres turns out to be equivalent to the statement that the space of maps to these targets, the space of harmonic maps with combined energy and index bounds has a good compactness theory. And that's somehow where all of this, uh, all of this comes from. So I'll just remark, you know, as k goes to infinity, so, so for k sufficiently large, we can again show this is related to some kind of eigenvalue optimization problem for weighted Laplacians. So this again has some spectral interpretation. But really to sort of convince yourself that this is natural, I'll point out that if k equals n, then these maps are n, let's say, is equal to n is equal to Sn. This is just the identity. OK, so this is the min-max construction, which gives you back the identity map from uh, the sphere to itself. So it's not sort of some arbitrary thing. It's in some sense, you'd expect it to be the, the lowest energy, lowest complexity in terms of index uh, harmonic maps to spheres. So this is somehow the, the base case. OK. So maybe I'll briefly outline the the min-max construction and then tell you about the, the real analysis that goes into it. So the min-max construction, that you can write down using only the non-aspherical condition. And this is something that's shown up in several other places before. So how the new feature is that you can actually implement the min-max construction to produce harmonic maps when you add this no stable minimal two spheres condition. OK. So um, the idea for the setup is given some homotopically non trivial map from the k sphere into n, you can define. So let's take your e epsilon to be. So remember, n we'll think of as embedded in RL. And we'll take our Ginsburg-Landau approximation of the harmonic map problem again. OK. And then we can define E f sub epsilon. It doesn't really depend on the map here, just the homotopy class. And it's not even, you know, having distinct homotopy classes doesn't tell you it'll be uh, an actually different, uh, different map at the end. All right, but we can define this EF sub epsilon to be just the infimum for families u sub y, the max over y in B k plus 1, E epsilon of uy, where these families just generalize this construction that we had in the, the sphere valued case, right, where f was the identity. So we ask just that uy is identically equal to the constant f of y when y is in the boundary of this k plus 1 sphere, or this k plus 1 ball. OK? So that's enough to tell you by similar arguments we had before that this is going to be, has a positive lower bound. So we're doing something non trivial as epsilon goes to 0. Um, and I'll claim I won't show it to you in this lecture in the interest of time, but I'm happy to chat with anyone afterwards. You can construct, it's not hard, to construct families which have bounded energy and are in fact continuous in W12 um, and actually take values in N directly. It's important now that we're in, in supercritical dimension to make that work. But the point is you can directly construct families which are taking values in N and for which you know, the energy is uniformly bounded. So you can just sort of, uh, you get uniform bounds on this for arbitrary epsilon. So you can show that 
E f sub epsilon has a uniform upper bound independent of epsilon and define then this EF of MN to be the soup or the limit over epsilon of these EF epsilons. Okay? So same idea as before. We run min-max for this epsilon perturbation and we try to pass to the limit. Okay. So as before, because these are nice, you know, C2 functionals satisfying all the Palais smale and everything we want on a Hilbert space, it's not hard to produce uh, critical points realizing the, the min-max at the epsilon level. So we have E epsilon critical points, U sub epsilon, such that right, they realize this min-max energy. Let's see. And, yeah. E sub f epsilon, and crucially, they have the expected index bound. These are k plus one parameter families. So this is index bounded above by k plus one. Okay, so we can try to ask what happens as epsilon goes to the limit, and as usual, the problem is going to be energy concentration. But once you go from dimension two, in dimension two, energy concentrates around you know, these, these little harmonic S2s, so we get these nice bubble trees. In supercritical dimension, you don't have the same nice bubble tree story, but what turns out to be kind of remarkable is under these conditions, you have somehow no bubbling at all. So in general, supercritical dimension is much worse for these kind of compactness results. In this setting, it's in some sense uh, a little better. Okay, so what can we say? So if we um, pass to the limit as epsilon goes to zero, well, the analysis is carried out by Lin and Wang for these specific functionals, but sort of if you're just talking about sequences of harmonic maps, the real idea is go back to work of uh, Fang Hua Lin. This is in the late 90s and early 2000s. Something like this. Um, then what can you say? You can say that subsequently, u epsilon, well, it has bounded energy, right? So we know at least it's converging weakly to something, to some u, and u is going to be a weakly harmonic map from m to n. So it's in w12. It's a weak solution of the harmonic map problem. But we don't know a priori whether it's even stationary, right? whether you can move it around by diffeomorphisms and have it be critical under that condition. So a priori, there's very little we know about the, the regularity of this guy. Um, um, in particular, we don't have things like the monotonicity formula. So we have no, nothing uh, on this map individually to, to get us going. But we also know something about uh, the set where things degenerate. So, if we define, if we look at our measures, let's call these maps uj. Okay, so we define our, our energy measures to be, all right, this will be our duj squared d vol g. Then we know these are converging, you know, passing to a further subsequence weakly in C0 dual to some radon measure. mu, and this mu has a reasonably nice structure, which I'm sure is familiar to a lot of you. All right, so far, again, I'm only using the fact that these are bounded energy critical points. The index hasn't come into play at all yet. So mu, we can write as Well, it's going to be partially the energy density of our limit map. And if that were the whole story, we'd at least have strong convergence. And we'd be able to say that this map is also stationary, so a critical point for inner variations with some monotonicity and uh, partial regularity. So we'll do it like that. Okay, but we also get 
this co-dimension 2 concentration piece. So it's going to look like some measure with some density on this n minus 2 rectifiable set inside of m, which you can write down explicitly what that is. It's just somehow the set of points where the epsilon regularity small energy criterion fails at all scales as you pass to the limit epsilon goes to 0. Okay. So if in the Ginsburg-Landau context, this was written down by Lin Wang, but really it goes back to Lin's ideas in the, the harmonic map setting. OK. Um, second, uh, we know that even though u is not going to be necessarily stationary, we know that u and, if you like, this verifold sigma theta have a coupled stationarity condition. So we know that the integral over m of sort of the stress energy tensor of this map paired with dx plus the first variation of the spherifold on x, so integral theta t sigma x is always going to be, that should be dx, is 0 for any vector field, you know, smooth vector field x on m. OK? So if either one of these objects was separately stationary, then we'd at least end up with a stationary harmonic map and the stationary n minus 2 verifold. But uh, in general, you can't hope for that. And there are, in fact, examples by Ding, Li, and Li in the context of bounded energy harmonic maps where you don't get uh, individual stationarity in the end. All right, but still at least tells you that at this sort of coupled object, you have good uh, monotonicity and blow up theory. And uh, let's see. I mean, in the sense that it tells you what the first variation is in terms of the stress energy tensor. Then yes, so it's telling you that the first variation is like minus the distributional divergence of the stress energy tensor or something. But so sort of. Yeah. OK. Um, right, but to cut a long story short, I actually have another board there. So if we can show that. Um, this concentrated part vanishes, then we get to show that our limit is actually just a stationary harmonic map. And in fact, the same compactness theory would allow us good blow up analysis and dimension reduction techniques to get to the partial regularity, too. So let's see. I'll first just say that this is kind of the, the analytical driver is that given if n now, now let's impose our condition, no stable minimal two spheres, then you know, if we have energy bounds and Morse index bounds for a sequence of critical points, it doesn't matter what those precise bounds are, but just that they're uniform independent of epsilon, then u epsilon converges strongly in w12, no verifold part floating around, to uh, this limit u, which is stationary harmonic with finite index, in particular less than or equal to m. OK. So what's the, the gist of the idea? So. If we, again, if we replace stable there with just no minimal two spheres, then this already goes back to, you know, this appears in Lin and Wang's work or in Lin's work in the setting of harmonic maps. The idea is if you have energy concentration, then you can blow up at points to see uh, finite energy harmonic maps, which have uh, some additional symmetries 
in all but two directions. So in particular, if I sort of blowing up at points where this measure mu, so it points in the concentration set, where mu has a well-defined tangent plane in the measure theoretic sense. Right, we know we're rectifiable, so this will be hn minus 2 almost everywhere. Then we end up in a situation where we're in this, this theorem for some, say, you know, exhaustion of domains in Rn, but where now we get the additional condition. So we arrive at similar situation. on, say, the ball around the origin in Rn, where now we also have integral of du in the tangent directions. So if, let's suppose that you know, we blow up such that the tangent plane to sigma becomes like uh, 0 cross r to the m minus 2, and let's call that plane p, then the p components of this du are vanishing in L2. Right? And you can squeeze that out from the monotonicity formula or from sort of this, this stationarity here. OK, that we can find this hn minus 2 almost everywhere. All right. And the point is, after sort of choosing points even more carefully in there and choosing somehow the first scales where bubbling occurs, I'm sweeping a lot of details under the rug, but there are 10 minutes left, so that's kind of necessary. We end up with a non-constant harmonic map, smooth in fact. So we choose the first threshold where epsilon regularity is violated, u from Rn, and I'll write that as R2 cross Rn minus 2 into n, such that we actually have translation invariance. So we have u of, if we're writing this as, you know, z comma y, it's just phi of z for phi R2 to Rn, or excuse me, to n, a finite energy harmonic maps. In particular, it's going to be smooth and finite energy. And so by removability of point singularities, it's the same as s2 to n. OK? So this is all still just the Lin and Lin Wang from the energy bounds. We get this minimal two sphere in the end. But the observation is that if you also have index bounds with respect to compactly supported variations for this u, as we do, we inherit the index bounds here. That's actually not entirely trivial to show in the passage from the Ginzburg-Landau to the harmonic map world, but it's just a computation. So we have finite index. All right. So if we were in critical dimension, in dimension 2 to start out with, that would just tell us that this bubble has index bounded above by uh, you know, the index we started with. OK, so or, you know, of course, we know from, uh, from Alexi's talk yesterday that we can say much more. But in particular, finite index wouldn't rule out the bubble. It would just give you information about the index of the bubble. The point is that if we're in supercritical dimension, which is usually worse for compactness and regularity, then in fact, um, we can't have a bubble like this. So finite index, I won't uh, do it for you, but it's just a computation forces uh, phi to be stable as long as this n minus 2 factor is non-trivial, right, for n bigger than or equal to 3. The idea is it's been observed before that if this phi is stable, uh, excuse me, if it's unstable, then it's easy to cook up a variation to show that um, this u is unstable too. All right, but then you can just observe that if you have a compactly supported variation, which makes this u unstable, 
and you have this translation invariance, then you can translate that variation around as much as you want to get infinitely many copies with disjoint support, which would give you infinite index. Okay, so finite index at the level of this guy gives you stability here, which tells you that if you've done this blow up analysis because you had energy concentration and your compactness failed, you would end up with a stable harmonic map from S2, which is equivalent to saying you have a, a stable branched minimal two sphere. Okay? So that gives you the convergence to a stationary guy. Now, you can run the same arguments. So let me mention that, in general, given u from m to n, a stationary harmonic map, the partial regularity is not that good if you only have that information. Because even though you have nice monotonicity and epsilon regularity, you don't have compactness for blow up sequences in general. So if you take a singular point and you rescale, you could end up with sort of this bubbling behavior at the level of harmonic maps from Rn, and uh, you don't get to conclude anything about a, a tangent map in the end. So what's known is that just from epsilon regularity, you can read off that the Hn minus 2 measure of the singular set of a stationary harmonic map is 0. But it's a big open problem whether you can get this down to co-dimension 3. I think this is uh, attributed as a conjecture of hearts. Okay? So that's a, a major open problem. And the key difficulty here compared to, say, the minimizing case, which was understood thoroughly by Shane and Uhlenbeck, is that you don't have compactness at the level of blow-up sequences. So the point is, in addition to getting a stationary limit here, we can also repeat the same compactness argument. And at a singular point of a stationary finite index, u m n to n, where n has no stable minimal two spheres, you can actually blow up. Again, you can rule out bubbling by the same argument, because you have no stable two spheres floating around. And you get convergence to a zero homogeneous finite index harmonic map u tilde from Rn into n. OK, but I claim that we had regularity up to the dimension where the first stable one of these appeared. But here we just are using our symmetry again. If we had instability, then we would have some compactly supported deformation that would decrease the energy of this map. By a little cutoff function, we could arrange that that's you know, supported away from the singular set, in particular supported away from the origin. So it's supported on some annulus. But this is a zero homogeneous map, so we can translate those variations around, or we can you know, scale them out to get an infinite sequence that's supported on disjoint annuli, which would give us infinite index. So in fact, if you have symmetry plus the finite index, you have infinite symmetry like this plus finite index, you have to be stable. So you get not only the compactness theory to get a stationary limit, but then applying that level of blow-up sequences, you get the sort of optimal uh, partial regularity. OK, and I've already taken up almost three hours of your time, so I'll go ahead and stop there. So why is it yeah. homogeneous? Sorry? Why is it homogeneous? Oh, that's a consequence of the monotonicity formula. That's just sort of falls out when you test at the limit. I mean, the monotonicity formula tells you not only that this n minus 2 energy density is, is increasing, but it gives you a right-hand side that's exactly the you know, L2 of the radial derivatives. Okay. OK, so I'll stop there. <laughs>